Kashmir, in fact, because last week the Indian Home Minister, Amit Shah, dismissed mounting criticism over the government's decision to suspend communication in that area since the beginning of August. Mr Shah said a lack of telephone connection was not a human rights violation. Rights groups have argued that access to communication is a basic right. The Hindu right-wing BJP government in India imposed a security clampdown and suspended mobile and internet connection after it revoked the special status of Indian Kashmir. Officials say landlines, which had also been cut off, are now working in most areas. But mobile and internet connections remain suspended. Hundreds of people, including Kashmiri political leaders, are still in detention. Well, I've been speaking to the Kashmiri novelist, Mirza Wahid. I've stopped trying every morning because in the first month of the siege, I would wake up, my hand would automatically reach out for the phone, try my dad's number, my sister's number, everyone else in the family. It would not get through, no texts, nothing. But now, after about six weeks, they have restored, mercifully, landlines in the area. Good old-fashioned landlines are working now. But even so, you can't call on all of them. For instance, I can't call my father's landline still two months into the siege. So what happens is sometimes if you try, like let's say 30 times, 40 times, 50 times, you might get to to a landline by some quirk. And can people call out? Not international. They don't want you, for instance, to dial into a Kashmiri household to find out how Mm. they are. I think it's as simple as that. It's quite clear. What can you establish in your mind as to what it is like there at the moment? It is the same as it was in the early 90s. In the early 90s, I was there. I I grew up in Kashmir. I was a teenager. And uh, we would have sieges and long curfews. There was one curfew that lasted about 70 days. I I lived through that. So it's more of the same. But this is more vicious. There's a streak of, I feel, a streak of vengeance to it. Because when you arrest thousands of people, thousands, um, the official number is 4,000, but there was a fact-finding mission, and they came back with a staggering number. They said 13,000 people have been arrested. But the most worrying aspect is they've arrested kids as young as nine, and that is confirmed. But it gets worse. They defended the detention of minors by saying it's not illegal. Under what law, we don't understand. What about moves that realistically must be going on? Because if you are besieged, then you are in some cases going to try and resist that. I mean, what evidence is there of of opposition or or resistance mobilizing in any way? There haven't been widespread protests, but there have been repeated protests in pockets. For instance, the most uh, now well-known pocket of resistance is just outside Srinagar. In fact, not very far from where my family lives in Sora, which is a large neighborhood. And they have barricaded themselves as a symbolic protest that we're not going to let you in. And for two months now, the Indian Armed Forces haven't been able to breach these barricades. You see, what they did was they arrested so many people. The guiding principle was arrest anyone with even a tiny bit of influence, by which I mean not just political leaders. They have arrested lawyers. They have arrested business leaders. To what end, do you think? Because clearly, leaving aside the politics of this... If authorities behave like that, they cause resentment. If in the end they start to relax the rules that are currently in place, those who feel resentful will do something about it. So to what end is all this, do you think? Because they don't have a long-term plan. This is, they're playing it in an ad hoc manner. And what they haven't accounted for is, as you rightly said, Kashmir right now, to me, even though I'm far away, feels and sounds like a massive colossal pressure cooker. Because if you keep people detained, also there's a sense of humiliation that has been added to the siege this time around, which is to say the Kashmiris have been told, look, if we can do all these things to you, we will never ask you anything. You will not be consulted, let alone forget consulting you. We will take away your phones, which has added a layer of humiliation to all this. And I worry that it's going to erupt because history tells us Kashmiris have never relented. It's been tried before. In the 90s when I was growing up, it was brutal. You know, right now, thankfully, many people haven't been killed. In the 90s, they would kill people by the score. They would be like, you know, I myself witnessed heaps of slippers left behind by people who have been taken to hospitals or to morgues. Mounds of slippers on, on main streets. What of the international reaction? 
very interesting and important question because I don't think the Indian state or the policy makers who sort of devised, de devised this strategy had accounted for the widespread international reaction. For instance, in the press, in the UK, in, in America, across Europe, there has been a lot of coverage of what's been going on in Kashmir. In fact, it's unprecedented because I don't remember seeing Kashmir on the front pages of major newspapers or major broadcast networks like the BBC or the CNN in such a sustained manner. Coverage, yes, but international political pressure? Political pressure, we all know what happens with political pressure. India is a massive market. It's a growing market. But tomorrow, if the Indian economy falters, which means it might not remain a big market for the Americans or the Brits, then they might talk to India about human rights, sadly. And if you're a young child in Indian-administered Kashmir now, what impact is this all going to have, do you think? Uh, you can be one very, very angry. And right, right now, when from uh, because I try to read everything and hear everything and watch everything, the youth are very, very angry. And the overarching, the dominant feeling is revenge, which, as we all know, no one wants because that means violence. And violence breeds more violence, which means no end uh, to solution. But in terms of long-term impact, a few years ago, there was a survey, the first of its kind, which was done by MSF, and they established 49% of the population of Kashmir suffers from some form of PTSD. 49% Post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. Yeah. That is half the population. And women are affected worse. They are among the worst sufferers because they ha carry the burden doubly, I like to think. So that is the last 30 years. This means a continuation of that state of affairs, which means you have a broken, bruised, brutalized population, and the only thing they will do at when they are allowed to do is they will rise up and they will not have a care about their lives. If you make their lives so miserable and so shorn of dignity, then history tells us those people, when they have nothing left, the only thing they can do is they just don't care about their lives anymore. The Kashmiri novelist uh, Mirza Wahid. Um, Vaidya, you mentioned that you'd written about this issue yourself in the last few days, few weeks. How much did your message chime with the one that we've just heard? Oh, it chimes completely. I call what's happened in Kashmir a constitutional coup. And I think uh, the government is being extremely short-sighted because they have completely lost the hearts and minds of the Kashmiris. Uh, their traditional leaders, who've not been anti-India, have been put in prison under a draconian act, which is called the Public Safety Act, under which people can be put away for two years without any charges being brought, without trial, without anything. I mean, you just... Uh, uh, and there are venerable, respected uh, leaders uh, in Kashmir who have suffered that state. Uh, as he, as Mirza said, it's across the board. It's lawyers, writers, um, journalists uh, who have been put away. There is nothing you can get out of it. I have had students who've just returned from Kashmir uh, and I was really worried about them because I couldn't get in touch with them. And she told me how how her kid brother, who was 17 years old, walking back home, came back with a bag full of pellet injuries. And those had to be picked out from his skin one by one with tweezers, a highly painful process. But the family did not wish to take him to the hospital because there he'd be picked up by the police and taken away. So that's what's happening. You, you mentioned hearts and minds, and clearly within Indian administered Kashmir, the impact in terms of people's views and emotions are clear. But across the rest of India, as I understand it, there's a lot of support for this. Oh, there is a lot of support for this simply because India has now become a majoritarian Hindu nationalist state. And Jammu and Kashmir has been the only uh, Muslim majority state in India. And the general feeling, which has been fueled and funneled uh, by the ruling BJP party, which is led by Mr. Modi, is to say that, hey, we are putting the Muslims in their place, finally. Uh, we are going to get 
land in Kashmir, which has been off limits uh, so far, because Kashmir has 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 had its own constitutional it, uh, constitution, its own flag, its own constituent assembly, and its own regional parliament, and that's all gone. Um, the international reaction, uh, Jeff, I mentioned that when I was talking to Mirza Wahid, and he was saying he was quite pleased to see how much has been written about it and maybe broadcast about it. 